Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to try and answer your top 20 questions about the brand new DJI FPV drone. Now, ever since the drone was released, we've gotten a lot of questions from viewers on the drone, the controller, the goggles, the battery system, pretty much the entire FPV kit. So we sat down and put together a list of what we felt were the 20 most common questions, and I'm gonna answer those today. Now, if you have a question that I'm not gonna cover in this particular clip, make sure you drop it in the comments below, and I promise you, we'll go through those. If we have to, we'll put another clip together and make sure everybody gets the answers they need. Now, anytime a new drone comes out and we get it early, we do a ton of testing with it. And I've had this for a bunch of weeks. We've been out flying it, done a ton of testing with it. So a lot of these questions were actually questions that we we had ourselves, but I don't like to just ask a question and answer it. I like to give you a little bit of background on some of these answers, just so you understand how it impacts your flight experience with the drone. I also have to tell you that of all the drones we've reviewed, this one had by far the most questions that came in about it, and I totally understand that because it's kind of a radically new design for DJI, and I know there's a lot of camera drone flyers out there that are interested in FPV, and they're wondering if this drone might be right for them. So I feel like I want to answer as many questions as I can because I've got the drone, I'm flying the drone and I want to be here to answer the questions that you're thinking about if you're deciding whether this drone makes sense for you or not. So we'll do this clip today. I promise you if more questions come in and I'm sure they will, we'll put a second and third clip together if we have to to answer the residual questions that come in. All right, so let me get started with the questions. I actually had to write them down because some of them are pretty complicated. So I'll put my old man glasses on here so I can actually read the paper here. So I'll start off with the drone. The first question we got, which is probably the most common question, and one of the ones that was puzzling to me as well, is can the DJI FPV aircraft directly connect to the DJI Fly application via your smartphone? And the answer to that is no. And I know why that question has been asked, because DJI kind of marketed this as a hybrid drone, meaning if you're a camera flyer today or a conventional drone flyer today that's flying the Mavic Air 2, the Mini 2, or any of the Mavic products, really any drone, you want to sort of look at your controller with a phone attached to it so you can actually see what's going on. So that's the experience you're used to today. With the FPV drone, you're connecting to the goggles and the way you're flying it's using the FPV functions inside the goggles. You can connect it to your smartphone as a secondary monitor, but you can't really fly it with the smartphone on the controller, which was a little frustrating for me because I think it would have been a bigger market had they put a little attachment on here where I could put my smartphone on it, choose to fly with the goggles one day, and choose to fly with the controller another day, but you can't do it directly. The second question is kind of related to that, and that was, will this be compatible with the DJI Smart Controller? Um, and the answer is no, it won't be, because the technology inside this drone is using a version of OcuSync, which is more advanced than what the Smart Controller can support today. So the Smart Controller is fine with OcuSync 2, this is OcuSync 3. Now, as an engineer, I can tell you that they're all using the Wi-Fi band, so it's communicating on 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. It wouldn't be that big a stretch that OcuSync 3, which rides on top of that same transmission technology, which is just a different scheme of how they access the drone, it would seem to be that you might be able to update the firmware inside the smart controller to accommodate OcuSync 3. But again, I don't know at this point. I will ask DJI if that's something they're thinking about. But I think that would be a brilliant move because if you own that smart controller, you now have a controller with a screen built into it where I can fly this like a conventional drone. Now, if obviously the joysticks won't adjust if you're going to fly it in full on FPV. But if you're trying to make this a bridge drone between conventional camera drones and true on FPV drones, that's a great place to go with it. But today you can't use anybody else's controller with it and you can't even use the smart controller because of that OcuSync 3 technology. All right, the next question was, what field of view does the DJI FPV aircraft support? So this is a pretty easy question to answer. It's 150 degrees field of view is available when shooting at 50 uh, or 100 frames per second. For other frame rates, the FOV drops to 142. So you're getting a really nice wide field of view. And that's super important if you're flying FPV because you're constantly looking for your next, you're like a shark swimming around. You're constantly looking for that, that next gap you want to go through. So having a nice wide view and first person view is super critical for that. So it's nice and wide. Does the DJI FPV aircraft support manual adjustment of the camera parameters? And it does. There's some adjustments you can make inside the software, like EV, saturation, white balance, and color temperature are all supported. So you can adjust it a little bit, but I found that in automatic mode, it does a really good job of adjusting on its own. So it really depends on how much cinematography experience you have and how much you want to tweak those settings. But there are some adjustments in there. Um, what are the DJI FPV's aircraft maximum supported video resolution and frame rate? Another great question. It'll record in 
X.264 and 265, so there's two different formats. In HD mode, it supports up to 4K, 60 frames a second video, which is pretty incredible in its digital transmission back to your controller. In smooth mode, it supports up to 1080p, 120 frames per second. So there is a difference in those two. And again, when you're flying in the field, you're probably gonna wanna do it in 4K. So if you do that, you're gonna get 60 frames a second, which is really nice. All right, so let's move on to the goggles next. What's the difference? And this is a really popular question because a lot of people bought the version one of the FPV system, which is the version one goggles. And they want to know what's the difference between the first version goggles and this new version two goggles. And the simple answer there is that this new technology inside the FPV drone flies with uh, both 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz because it's using OcuSync 3, which is a, it uses a frequency hopping technology and part of its schema. So it's always looking for the best possible transmission frequency in either 2.4 or 5.8. These support both 2.4 and 5.8. The original ones only support one of those frequencies, so they aren't really compatible, but you can use them. Uh, it really depends on how you want to fly that drone and, and where you're going from there. But this is definitely a much more sophisticated set of goggles, which has wider applicability, quite honestly, with other versions of drones that are out there on the market today. So the next question was, what is the video transmission latency of the FPV goggle version two, these guys? And that's super important because when you're flying FPV, <laughs> you're screaming along at the ground and anything coming up at you that you have to avoid or try to find that gap between trees, you need to know that immediately. So if the latency, meaning the time between when you see it and when you see it in your goggles is long, you're gonna crash into something because by the time you make the adjustment, you've already hit that tree. So the latency is really small in this. Uh, the average latency in this uh, is lower than 28 milliseconds in smooth mode, which is right in line with all of the digital systems out there. Any of the major systems that are using digital transmission in the FPV space are around 30 milliseconds. This is 28 milliseconds in smooth mode and up to 40 milliseconds in high definition mode. The reason for that is there's a lot more information in HD mode coming back at your controller. It takes up more bandwidth and it slows down that transmission back. So if you're really concerned about latency, make sure you, you fly in smooth mode. The next one is what's the difference between recording with the FPV goggles and recording with the camera and the aircraft? And there's a big difference there. So you have the ability to slide a micro SD card into the drone just like you do with all the drones and record directly on that SD card. Same thing with the goggles. You can screen record of what you see inside the goggles uh, by sliding an SD card in over here as well. The difference between those two is this is a much higher resolution recording than that is because that relies on the transmission back to the goggles, which isn't being done at 4K. So if you want the highest resolution, you want to record it on the drone and then use that SD card to transfer it to your computer for any kind of editing you're doing. It is nice you can record it in the goggles and I like doing that as well because it, it sort of gives me a second copy if you will, but this is definitely a higher resolution uh, recording it on the drones. Uh, let's see here. Can I, oh, we're gonna talk about batteries next. Okay, so a lot of people asked about the battery. I mean, this looks like a battery bank and the question is, can I charge my phone using the battery of the DJI FPV goggles V2? And you can't. And it should be obvious you can't for a couple of reasons. Number one, Normal USB charging is a five volt charge and it's either an amp and a half, two amp, two and a half amp. And that's what all USB devices charge on today, except for the smart devices that are fast charging like the PD or the QC devices, they can vary the voltage up and down. This is a nine volt battery. So if you connect up a standard uh, USB-C connection here to your phone, you're pushing too much voltage to that phone. So you definitely don't want to use this to charge any of your portable devices. It's custom made for these goggles. I almost wish that they came up with a proprietary connector here so you couldn't inadvertently connect up a USB-C cable to it and try to charge some other things, but they did try their best and put little ridges on either side of here, which kind of prevents a USB-C cable from going in there, but you can't use it to charge your phone, and that's the short answer to that one, which I, which I made longer. Uh, let's see, do the FPV Goggle V2 support audio transmission? And that question comes from the original version of the FPV system. A lot of FPV flyers were upset that the audio from the quad that they actually attached that to, the FPV quad, wasn't transmitted as part of that stream back to the goggles. And that's important, and it didn't really, it didn't bother me that much, but a lot of flyers out there really like to hear their motors. They like to hear the speed of the motors and how they're performing. And I guess it makes sense because it gives you a little bit of insight into how the drone's performing. And if you've drawn, flown that drone an awful lot, you get used to a certain pitch on those motors when it's doing certain things. And if you hear something skiddy out, the skittish out there, it may indicate that those motors are going to fail. So the original version didn't transmit the audio back. This new system does transmit the audio back. So if you connect up a set of earbuds to this on the audio output jack and put them in your ears, you're going to hear the motor screaming through the air as you're flying it. So that's a really big benefit. So that was an upgrade over the version one. 
Uh, can I adjust the interpupillary distance of the DJI FPV goggles V2? You certainly can. You have an adjustment between 50, 58 and 70 millimeters, and that's super important because your, your eyes are not the same. So I have a nice big fat head, so my eyes tend to be a little wider than most. If you've got one of those skinny heads and you're good looking, they're going to be a little closer, and you've got sliders on the bottom of this where you can make those adjustments. Now, another question, which I'll probably get to, and I'm going to step on myself because I'm getting to it early, is can I use goggles? I should say, can I use glasses with the goggles? And the answer to that is I use these cheater goggles or glasses. These are sort of just reading glasses where they do a 2x improvement over my reading and I'm reading this paper. I need these to fly. These fit fine inside the goggle housing. I can put the goggles on, no worries with my glasses, I can keep them on and fly. If you have gigantic lenses, I'm not sure you can get inside there with the frame. So if your frames are gigantic, they may not fit inside the goggle housing, but DJI is making available adjustable lenses, I guess, that you can snap in there to adjust for whatever eyesight you may have, maybe something you want to look into. And that's one of the big problems with virtual reality and augmented reality goggles in general, is that guys like me that need reading glasses have a hard time with those goggles. And I know when we did reviews of other augmented reality goggles, um, they made lenses available that you could actually take your prescription, send it to them, and they would cut lenses that would snap into those augmented reality goggles to adjust for your, your eyesight, which is a really good thing. But for me, if I don't use the reading glasses with it, it's kind of blurry in there, and that's not something you want to fly with, not having a crisp view of what's going on. Uh, all right, so the next question was, can I use my reading glasses? I just answered that one's question number 12, so I skipped that one. Um, operating time of the goggles, 110 minutes on a full charge. Now I've run them, that's almost, an hour, that's almost two hours. I've run them, I think an hour and a half without any issues whatsoever. And there's plenty of, plenty of current still left in them or plenty of capacity still left in them. So you're going to get about two hours. And again, if you want to fly longer, you can get more of these and you can definitely, you know, carry a second battery with you, reboot the goggles and you'll be good to go. All right, let's talk about the controller a little bit. Folks want to know what the difference was between the version one and the version two. It should be obvious, the version two is a brand new design from the ground up. I said at the beginning, it looks a lot like a game controller. I think they've done a really good job with it though. I mean, it feels really well balanced in my hands. I like that. Joysticks fall right under your thumbs where you need them. Nice flip up antenna. There's no worry about having dual antennas that are pointing in different directions. They kind of have this locked together. All the buttons for controlling it are within reach as well. They put a nice lanyard hook on the front. So I think they really thought it through, but the fundamental difference uh, architecturally is obvious, but the technology differences are, again, OcuSync 3, 2.4, 5.8 gigahertz transmission technology. They've increased the distance on it as well. So again, you can you can broadcast this thing forever. I mean, it's the, the longest I've seen on any drawn out there as far as transmission distance goes. Uh, can the controller directly connect to a smartphone? That question, which is the first question I, I had on here, probably was asked, I'm gonna say we probably had 70, between 70 to 100 people ask that specific question. And I understand why, and I'm also a little frustrated that it isn't, because I, I wish you could snap a controller, I should snap a smartphone on here, and use this like you do with a conventional drone to fly this when you're flying it in standard mode or normal mode. Because then I'd be able to fly it just like a regular drone, I could see what was going on. I can't really do that. What I've got to do is use the goggles, and if I want to see it on a screen, I've got to set up a tablet or a phone on a table and fly it that way. There is no way to attach a, a yet. There may be, I'm sure, the third party's working on some kind of attachment to attach your phone to it, but there's no way to easily do that. That's the one thing I'd pick on with this design. I wish they'd come out with a bracket, even if it was removable, that would allow me to keep a smartphone on here so that I could use this sort of, you know, directly with the drone. But today you can't. So you've got to, you've got to use the goggles. And if you don't want to use the goggles, set them on the ground, connect up the cable from the goggles to your smartphone, and then you can sort of fly with your smartphone. All right. Can the controller directly connect to a computer? You can. And you do that for a couple of reasons. You do that, same thing with the drone. You can connect that up to a computer as well. You would do that on the drone to transfer the files off there. Now, I like to pop the SD card out. I'll use one of the Drone Valley 4-in-1 memory card readers, which we designed, by the way. Shameless plug there. You can actually slide that micro SD card into, connect it to your tablet, your phone, your computer, and transfer those files at high speed. But you can also connect the cable directly up to this USB-C cable and transfer them over that cable. It'll show up as a another storage location and you can move the files off. That tends to be a little bit slower, actually a lot slower than the SD card. And I'm not a patient guy, so I like popping the card out and doing it. You can connect this up to your computer as well. Why would you do that? Well, the same reason you do this is to push firmware from the DJI Assistant 2. So if you don't want to do the over-the-air firmware updates, connect it to your computer, open up the Assistant 2, push the firmware to the drone, push the firmware to the controller, and you're off and running. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, operating time of the controller, about nine hours on a full charge. Now, I'll be honest on that, totally honest. I haven't tested the length of that. I probably should charge it fully, turn it on, make a connection to the drone, and, and let it run. The challenge is that test is going to be hard because these guys aren't going to run nine hours. And just having it run on its own, it's going to run a lot longer than nine hours because it's not wasting those electrons. or not wasting them, but using those electrons to transmit, right? The transmitters are drinking most of those electrons in the battery. So I'm going to trust that it's nine hours. I think the thing you need to remember there is it's far longer than any other component in the system. So if this is 110 minutes and this is 20 minutes per battery, you'd have to chug a lot of batteries through this thing over the course of a day to run out of power on the controller. So I'd worry less about that. If you're really concerned about having a really long day of flying, pick up a second battery and you're probably gonna want four or five batteries for your drone because the average in high speed mode, in acro mode, uh, or in manual mode, you're gonna fly this thing uh, 10, 12 minutes, 15 minutes if you're pushing it. For me, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes is really the limit to get it back with a reasonable amount of power still left in the battery so I can safely land it and not have that panic moment of like, am I gonna make it back to the home point before the thing decides to land on its own? So anyway, that's the answer to that one. All right, uh, can I remove the spring effect on the joysticks? You absolutely can. And that's a great question because if you're flying normal, you like the spring return to center kind of function. But if you're flying FPV, you're going to hate that. FPV flyers want to have the ability and the tension to sort of move this up and down and have it rest down the bottom if you need to. And the way you do that is pull these two pads off. It came with a tiny little Allen wrench, or you can use one of the Drone Valley 28-piece precision screwdriver sets, which another shameless plug. You pull up the rubber. There's two adjustments right here. You basically slide that in. You adjust the tension on one, and you release the spring on the other one, and then you're Ready to go in FPV mode. And if you're going to fly in FPV mode a lot, you can leave it, you know, in that mode and you're good to go. If you want to go back to flying it as a normal quad, turn the spring back on and you're good to go there. All right, so that's that one. Let's see. 18, that's 18. 19. What smart functions does the system support? And that, again, is one of the things that separates this quad from a standard FPV quad. What DJI is brilliant at is building products that have a lot of safety built in. And I know a lot of, I get a lot of grief for talking about the NFZ system that's built into their standard drones. A lot of people are like, I wanna fly where I wanna fly. The NFZ system keeps you from flying into areas that you shouldn't be in. They're absolutely federally restricted areas where you can't take your drone. This has NFZ in it. So you're not gonna get in trouble flying this thing into a zone that you shouldn't be in. It also has return to home, which is a great feature because if you fly it and you're excited and you don't watch the battery levels and you get it out too far, it's gonna know, hey, the battery's getting really low, I'm coming home. It takes over and comes back and lands exactly where you took it off. The other thing it's got is a version of obstacle avoidance. Now it's not pure obstacle avoidance like you get on a lot of the camera drones like the Mac series where if it's approaching something and it's going to hit it, it's going to stop. It's not going to let you run into the tree. With this one, it's kind of a modified version where it slows down when it gets close to something, especially in, in uh, normal mode, where it slows down. It won't actually smack into the tree, but if you want, you can drive it right into that tree. So if you're coming to a tree and you see it in your goggles, it'll stop and say, Rick, watch out, there's a tree, but you can still push that stick forward and run into the tree if you want. So just be aware of that. All right, so the last question which I saved to last on purpose because it's a very complicated question that I can't possibly answer in this clip or we're gonna be here an hour. But I promise you, I'm working on another clip that explains this in more detail. But the question is, fundamentally, who is this drone for? And the reason that's a hard question to answer is because I've seen a zillion clips on YouTube where half the camp is trashing it, saying it's garbage, don't buy it, it's terrible, it's the worst FPV thing ever built. The other camp is saying, hey, we like it, we like the hybrid aspects of it. I'm a camera flyer today, I'd love to dip my toe into the FPV space. Then the FPV guys come back and go, oh, you're gonna crash it and you can't replace parts on it, all the rest of that stuff. So it's a tough question to answer. I've been a fan of this since it was released and I've had it for a couple of months, I've been flying it like crazy. So I'm here to tell you, it's not perfect. If you're an FPV flyer, you probably have a lot of reasons to hate this drone because it's it's bigger. It's, you know, it's got things built into it that FPV drones don't have, like NFZ zone. So an FPV flyer can fly wherever they want to fly. With this one, you can. It's going to restrict where you fly. It isn't crash proof. I know a lot of the other FPV drones that I fly, that I've built, that other flyers fly, have carbon fiber frames, they're small profiles. Everything on there I can pull off in the field and replace for the most part if I have a portable soldering iron with me. With this one, there's only three things you can change. You can change the hood, you can change the camera, and you can change the landing gear. So if you smack this into a tree doing 87 miles an hour and break one of the front arms, it's gotta go back to DJI for repair. I understand if you're an FPV person, you hate that because you're, you're a nerd like me, you're building stuff from the ground up and you wanna just replace stuff that breaks. So it isn't perfect from that perspective. Where it is perfect though, and this is what I'll argue with anybody out there, and I've done it on the channel a few times, is that if you're a camera drone flyer, and maybe you're an older guy like me that doesn't fly a lot of FPV. I still do, but a lot of older folks tend not to fly FPV, but you're really interested in it. 
because you went out and you bought the DJI goggles for your Mavic products, you really like that experience, and you're thinking, I could get into FPV. This drone gives you the ability to sort of start what you know today, so fly it like a regular drone with the FPV goggles on. So now you've got a different perspective of looking at what the drone's seeing from the air, and you can get used to that, on your own pace, and you're flying it with all the safety measures built in, so the auto leveling, the crash avoidance, all the things that you're used to with your drone today, you can fly it and get used to the FPV experience first. Once you're happy with that first person view, which again is a dramatically different experience than flying it looking at a screen, then you can say, you know what, I'm gonna get a little bit braver and I'm gonna turn on sport mode where it flies a little faster, starts doing a little bit more banking that's more FPV-like, and fly it for a couple of weeks like that. Don't go out and go right into manual mode. I promise you, if you go into manual mode and you spin up the motors, you put it up in the air, the first time you take a dive, you're gonna pancake it. It's gonna end up in the ground, broken with an arm, it's gotta go back to DJI. So take your time, fly it, in normal mode first, get used to it. Enjoy the goggles, enjoy that FPV experience, get really comfortable with that. And then when you're brave, go out on a Sunday morning, click the button and hit it in sport mode, start flying there. Keep it low, keep it close, be brave about it, but be careful when you're flying it. And once you're comfortable with that, then you're ready for manual mode. And that's when you're in full FPV acro mode. Now it's not, it's, it's not something that you should tempt the first day. You should take your time and get good at it because again, uh, any FPV flyer out there will tell you, and I'll agree with them, the way you learn to fly FPV is by crashing a ton. You're gonna crash a lot. And if it's a standard FPV drone, not that big a deal. A lot of them have protections built in where I can bounce off a tree and not really destroy it. Others, if I break it in the field, I'll change out the parts I need to change out. Maybe I gotta go back to the shop and solder things together and apologize to the drone for hitting the tree, but you get better by crashing, which is a horrible way. Imagine if that was the case when you were driving your car. <laughs> the way you get to be a better driver is by crashing. And it kinda is to a certain extent when you're young. But so anyway, I'm, I'm diverging from the concept here. It's a great drone. It's a wonderful drone for what it does. And again, what I applaud about this drone, it's not for everybody. I think it's a great drone if you're flying camera drones today and you're interested in FPV, to move to this, to give you that experience of FPV with the goggles, I think is a wonderful thing. And I think that's exactly what DJI was looking for, is to bring the vast majority of flyers that are camera flyers today into the FPV space, which is a smaller space, and to introduce them to that concept because both sides of that equation, including home-built stuff that fly airplanes, we're all part of the same community. I don't know why we feel the need to pick on other people, like the FPV guys don't like the camera guys, the home-built guys don't like either of us. Let's just get together and fly. We're all pilots. It's a great hobby. Maybe it's not for you. I love it. I think it's a great product, but I'm trying to give you all the information you need to understand why it may fit your needs. But I, I really feel like we get to get there as a community. We're a lot stronger and we're all out there having fun. So let's just have fun. The last thing I'll say is, and I'm predicting something here. I have no knowledge of this, no inside information. I'm not part of any ADA group or anything, but I believe fully this system could easily support a different drone very easily. So what's to say in a couple of months time, you bought this system, you've got the goggles, you've got the controller, you bought this drone, you crashed it three times, you're done with it. DJI comes out with a smaller, more classic styled FPV drone. And it just works with the stuff you already own. Maybe they're even coming out with a tiny whoop style drone where you can fly it with this gear as well. What they built here is infrastructure that today supports this FPV drone. But there's nothing to say that down the road, technology you already own, you've got the goggles, you've got the controller, would support a new drone. So let's see where that goes and let's not worry about it so much. But I think today, if you're considering this drone, the things you should remember are that it flies really well. It's more expensive than other options on the market. You can go out and buy a Mavic 2 Pro for about the same money and have a pure camera drone, but it's not gonna do FPV stuff. This one gives you the ability to sort of move into that FPV space at your own pace. And I think it's a wonderful hybrid drone that bridges that gap, if there's such a thing, between traditional camera flyer drones and FPV flyer drones. And again, it's not perfect on either end of that scale. It's not the best camera drone. It's not the best FPV drone, but it's the only drone in that space that allows you to move between those two different worlds. So anyway, that's pretty much it for today. Now, I know I went on a little long at the end here. I promise you I have a whole clip coming out that compares this to the Mavic Air 2 and the Mini 2 and a couple of other drones to explain maybe the differences between them. But I wanted to get these questions answered as quickly as possible. And if I've missed a question that you have that we haven't answered today, please drop that in the comments below. I promise you we read all the comments. We respond to as many as we can as quickly 
quickly as we can. But if I have to put another clip together to answer more questions, I'm happy to do that. Or even a third and fourth clip if I have to, because it's important for me that you get the information you need on any product we discuss in the channel so you can make a reasonable decision on whether it makes sense for you or not. And this drone is no different. So thanks an all thought for watching. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button down there. I've got a ton more high-tech clips coming. I have so much cool stuff I'm going to be talking about in the channel in the next week or two that you're definitely going to want to be here to hear about it. And that's pretty much it for today. So thanks again for watching, and until next time, happy flying. Thank you.